The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is the Franklin Partnership, Omar Nashashibi and John Guzik. We're going to give people just barely another 60 seconds or so, and then we'll go ahead and get started to give you a quick overview of what happened with the elections and where do we go from here. So bear with us for just another 30 seconds or so, and we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining our webinar today for the National Tooling Machining Association and One Voice. Uh, today, we are hoping to give you a quick overview of what happened, try to make some sense of the election, and moving forward, what to expect with the new incoming administration in Congress. Before we get started, a couple of quick housekeeping issues here. Many of you have already been on a number of NTMA webinars in the past. You'll notice on the right-hand side, there is a toolbar in there. You can type in any questions you have along the way. We encourage you to type those as you think of them, because we'll try to answer them as we go through the presentation. But again, John and I will also try to reserve a little bit of time towards the end of the presentation to answer a few more questions. So as we start to get to rounding up once we pass the House of Representatives, that's how you know we're getting close to the end and start to think and typing up any questions that you might have on the right-hand side. This issue will be... Uh, we will be sending this out or it will be recorded this webinar so you can have access to it and be able to pass it around after the fact as well. And it's always feel free to reach out to us or answer you with any questions. But John, let's go ahead and get started. For those, uh, thanks, Omar. For those of you who do not know us, I'm John Guzik with the Franklin Partnership with my partner, Omar Nashishibi. We are NTMA's advocacy firm in Washington, a public policy bipartisan government relations firm. We've had the honor of representing NTMA and metalworking manufacturers for a number of years. Combined, we have over 100 years of experience. We had the honor of representing manufacturing, defense contractors, you meet municipalities, hospitals, and many other associations over the years. Like you, like us, have been probably relieved that this election is over with. And um, it has been a long, hard-fought campaign. Clearly, it was a result that nobody had predicted. And um, we're going to try to go through today our perceptions of what happened, what didn't happen, and how the results came to be the way they were. As we get started, the first thing to always remember is it takes 270 electoral college votes to be president of the United States. And that's the, the big thing. You're going to hear from a lot of aggrieved Democrats, and you already heard Harry Reid come out and say he lost the popular vote, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But that doesn't matter. You need 270 electoral college votes to be president. You can just go ask President Al Gore, he found that out the hard way, just as Hillary Clinton just did a couple of days ago. So 270 to win, what is the pathway? You'll see Michigan and New Hampshire haven't officially been called, but Michigan's going to go towards uh, uh, towards Trump on this one, and then New Hampshire's expected to go towards Hillary. It doesn't change the final numbers, but it certainly does push Trump over that 300 number that very few of us thought he could get to as we looked at the pathway to get to 270 to win. And you'll get the sense of who turned out. Was it a surge among certain Trump voters? Was it not? And as we go through some of these slides, you'll get a better sense. But for the most part, you look at the states here and how much red there is and all the blue, but no matter what, it still takes 270 electoral college votes to win. A couple, couple of interesting points here is it appears that President-elect Trump will have achieved 100 votes more, or, or Hillary got 100 votes less than President Obama received four years ago. And the clear indication is, is that that Midwest firewall of Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, clearly had broken for, uh, for President-elect Trump. And then we will hope to explain to you why we believe that happened. And that's exactly right. That blue firewall, a, a, coin, a term coined by Ron Brown, senior journalist, a few years ago, a couple de decades ago, as John mentioned, just really broke down in many ways. But it comes down to turnout. And this is really important to, to recognize. Was it a surge among those silent white male voters? Or was it just other people, part of Hillary's constituency, didn't turn out to the same numbers that 
they did for Obama, there was not a white surge. And the way you can really clearly tell that is as of right now, and these numbers, they keep changing and changing, but this is the popular vote. Hillary's down over Obama by about 6.2 million votes. Trump is down over Romney and McCain by about 1 million votes. So there was lower turnout in all the areas, which made the white male vote take up a larger piece of the pie than it should have. So as you take a look at your left column versus right, your 2012 versus 16, the white male vote should have dropped to about 33 or 32 percent. And you ask, well, what does 1 percent here or there make a difference? Well, you numbers folks on the phone will take a look at those numbers every single point counts, particularly if you're looking at African-American turnout down by a point. You're looking at unions turnout level, but then also those that are coming out for the 18 to 29-year-olds, it shouldn't have been 20 percent. Based on just general population growth, they should have made up a greater number and a greater margin, just as women should have done as well. Another area that uh, Hillary flagged in is we heard about the potential surge in the Hispanic vote, with Trump calling for, you know, putting up a wall and that the Hispanics were mobilized to vote. We saw pockets of it in states like Nevada, but in states like Florida, which we will touch on, that Republicans did better, Trump and other Republicans did better in some of those states. In fact, Trump got more Hispanic vote than Mitt Romney did just four years ago. So the, we didn't see, I mean, Hispanic vote only went up 1% while African American vote went down 1%. And so we saw the impact that that had on the election. And an absolutely huge impact. As John mentioned, we'll go through Florida here on the next slide in a minute, and you'll see that one was 31 to 34 percent going for Trump. But over here, just nationally, you're looking at the 29 percent going over Romney. But the key thing is, though, even in the battleground states, they wasn't even close to the 29 percent. In all, almost all the battleground states, with the exception of Florida, Trump was still pulling 11 to 15 percent with a high water mark of 18 percent among Latinos. And so there's no question they didn't come out clearly as much as many had anticipated. Those that did come out, and then even on the non-toss-up states, they voted a bit more with their pocketbooks, focusing on the economy, saying we need a businessman instead of business as usual. And the other factor here is many of them being uh, immigrants themselves or first, second generation immigrants came from many countries that were just swamped with corruption. And that message of corruption and more of the same really did hit them back home and, and made them either one, not want to come out or be able to look past some of the comments that Trump made early on when he launched his campaign with regards to Mexicans and Hispanics in general. Keep in mind, though, on this slide that we ask you to focus on two numbers down here when we go through the, the remaining on this one. Obviously, African Americans, you expected that to go down from 93 to 88%. You, you figured it would go down a little bit, but Hillary should not be doing worse than Barack Obama among women. That was just, that was one thing that she could not afford to do. But more importantly, from a manufacturing standpoint and where our high concentration is, you're going to see this union number being a really large impact. So we ask you, keep in mind this union drop off 58 to 51 percent. And granted, a good amount of that union support came from white men for Obama last time around because of the automotive situation, the support there, and the contrast they were able to draw with Romney. But this is still quite significant. You're going to see that play, play out. But John, as you just said, looking at where are we in some of the other states, does a third party really have an impact as much as some Democrats are going to try to blame them just as they did Al Gore, and the lines tell you no, it, it probably did not really affect Hillary lost for a bunch of other reasons in the third parties. And, and you know, what the Clinton campaign will say, well, if you didn't have, you know, Johnson and Stein on the ballot, that presumably those voters would be for Hillary. And if the, when you look at the raw numbers, that if those voters weren't there, that you know, that would make a difference in the campaign. Outside the Stein voters, which probably would be Clinton voters, there was there's diverse evidence of where the Johnson voters would go. You know, some of them were were anti-Trump voters, some of them were anti-Clinton voters. But in the end, all presidential elections have third-party candidates, and so there you you can't you utilize use the third-party candidate as an excuse of why you lost the election. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, because as you look at it, what we've seen in the trend on libertarian vote that traditionally would go Republican, in this case, we saw it actually drawing 60-40 away from Hillary for the most part, with a large part of that being just a lack of enthusiasm for her, among some of those young young students in particular, but yeah, it could have been enough to switch the 
race towards Hillary in probably two or three states, but enough to switch it for Trump in one. But that's not clearly enough, as John mentioned, because you look at a state like Florida here, which you always knew was going to be a very, very difficult pathway for any Democrat, largely because Obama barely got it by just under 1% last time around, 74,000 votes or so. So she knew she was going to have problems. Part of the challenge she had is they put an overemphasis on the Hispanic turnout, which actually did very, very well in Florida, particularly in the Miami-Dade County. You see that large line of blue that runs from Miami-Dade up through um, up to Fort Lauderdale and Broward and some of those areas. But the Hispanics did not make up for the massive turnout that we saw in the Panhandle, Fort Myers, Jacksonville, which is a huge Republican zone. And then you see where the T and the A are in Tallahassee up from there. Those are the central time zones, and those are pretty much more Alabama than they are Miami. How a candidate wins Florida is you've got Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, you know, the Palm Beach area. That is strong Democratic territory. You've got the north, the Panhandle, which is strong Republican. And then there's the I-4 corridor from basically Tampa, Orlando, um, over to Jacksonville. And that has been the swing state, swing part of, the, of Florida. And... There's a large Hispanic population, a large Puerto Rican population, even a, a growing Cuban population there. And the perception was that Hillary would do well in that I-4 corridor. And what we've seen, and we've seen, and this will become a little bit of a broken record throughout this presentation, is you had, well, Hispanics tur turned out well, Trump did better with Hispanics, women in the African American community, African American community underperformed in those areas, which are key areas, queen, uh, key swing areas in the state of Florida. And we saw where Cuban voted, as John mentioned, with regards to where the Hispanic turnout was. Yes, they came out quite a bit down south and not as much in the I-4 corridor there. That Actually, you see there's only two counties that are blue right there around the Orlando. That used to be five counties. So Trump did turn to several of them there from blue to red. But in fact, at the same time, a local congressman from that Orlando area, we'll touch on, a Republican did, did lose that space. So as we looked at the breakdown of the exit polls on Hispanics, it showed us that about 53% of Cubans voted for Trump in this case, which is actually a little bit down, which did make up and make some sense of how the Hispanics in this case just didn't buy a lot of what, what he was saying and weren't as concerned. But overall, that white men, Clinton down at 29% from 33% is very significant. Those of you that have heard John and I speak throughout this calendar year, yes. Obviously, we had predicted, like everybody else, that Hillary would win. But on one of those slides, those of you that have seen us speak, we said that Hillary could not win if she dropped below 34, 33%. 34% of white male votes, she could still pull it off, but 35% was her base. And you look, you're going to see a number of these slides right here at Florida. She got 29, dropping off from 33% of the white male vote. And that's really what killed her, especially in a state like Michigan, John. Like, you think? When you look at Michigan, that was a state that. Even I, leading up to the election, weren't buying some of the polls that I saw uh, that had Trump within three points of, of Clinton. But as we will discuss a little bit later, I think the turnout model put together by pollsters underestimated the strong white vote, the non-college educated white vote, and overestimated the turnout from the African American Hispanic community. Michigan is a prime example. You've got Detroit, you've got Oakland County, where Clinton underperformed, significantly underperformed what Obama did in that area, where in outstate, where it's big Republican area, big Trump area, that not that they necessarily overperformed, but they overperformed based on the election demographics that were taking place on that day. And so that is what happened to Michigan, people outstate, the voters outstate, which are largely white, not, not exclusively, and there's pockets in Flint and Saginaw and, and in, in Lansing and all, but in those areas, the white, uh, the non-college educated white folks were a larger percentage of the vote, and that's what made the difference with the underperforming African American community in Detroit, metropolitan Detroit area. Interesting, interestingly enough, I mean, this is the first time a Republican won the state of Michigan since 1988. There's a real, uh, and I'm sure we've got some folks from Michigan on the line. You know, remember Macomb County used to be the home of the Reagan Democrats. Well, uh, uh, I was talking to Sandy Levin, Congressman Sandra Levin, and you know, Macomb County is no longer the home of the Reagan Democrat. 
Macomb County has truly become a Republican county where Trump won overwhelmingly. Candace Miller, the former congressman who stepped down, ran for drain commissioner in Macomb County, typically a party-identified seat. She ended up winning that seat overwhelmingly for, for drain commissioner. And so I don't think we can no longer look at can no longer look at Macomb County as just a Democrat stronghold. It is truly a swing area, if anything, leaning Republican. A good amount of that, you have to look back to 2012 in terms of what happened with the automotive issues and the support that Obama uh, put out there on the backs of what W initiated. And clearly that helped push and inflate, frankly, a lot of Obama's numbers in that state and a couple of other areas. As we go to the next two slides in particular, or the next couple of states, we ask that you focus on two digits here, looking at unions again, and then looking at that major drop-off, 53, from down from 66%. That's an enormous drop-off. But in a state like Michigan, where we're looking at probably no more than a dozen or two thousand, thousand votes that are going to be the difference here, the drop-off, as John mentioned, in, in Wayne County, where Detroit is, that, that was a huge drop-off for that. In 90,000 fewer voters, that's the difference in the African-American turnout. Right below it in Oakland County was exactly dead even from last time. So it was African-Americans in that southeast corner. But then again, unions, as we've discussed, and you, many of you heard us say before, from Buffalo to Erie to Youngstown to Toledo and up through Michigan and parts of Wisconsin, have been very, very vulnerable areas for Democrats. So now we're going to highlight a couple of quick counties in the next couple of states that we look at. Macomb County, that switch, as John mentioned, look at that major drop-off in the swing that it went from Obama on the ledge that it was over to Trump. And you jump into a state like Ohio, which none of us really had in a toss-up column. Even the Clinton folks about mid-August knew that this was not a state that we're going to win. But the question was, where were some of those victories ramped up? How could the Democrats be able to build on some of Obama's successes there? They underperformed, obviously, in Cuyahoga County, up north around the Cleveland areas. There's no question. But again, the white men drop off. Unions. Talk about, look at the Youngstown. What happened in Youngstown? 25% drop off. Same thing that happened in Macomb. Same thing you're going to see in a minute in Pennsylvania. It's a real killer when you're starting to lose that chunk of a, of a population. I know there's a blackout there. Could you hear Omar, folks on the phone? So, so Pennsylvania was a another state very similar to Michigan and Ohio, where you saw a significant drop off in votes in the largely Democrat African areas with large African American populations, not just in, in, in the city of Philadelphia, but in the suburban areas. That is where. Uh, there is a significant drop off in the African American support for Hillary Clinton, and that we saw like, once again, like we have seen in other states, maintaining the the, the white white voters who came out to vote. And so that's the like Ohio, like in Pennsylvania, we saw similar situations. One area you really want to focus on as well is looking at the Scranton area. This is the old Joe Biden country where they would be sending Joe over there all the time to where he grew up. That's Lackawanna County, just a little bit up and away from Philadelphia. And that's another major swing. So as we talked about Macomb County a little bit ago, we talked about Youngstown area. This is another one of those areas that is traditionally manufacturing heavy. And that is a continuous theme that you're going to hear from us. The Rust Belt manufacturing, not just white voters, but people that are really focused on the economy in general. And here in Pennsylvania was one of those where it really, really showed that he just wasn't, she just wasn't able to get where she needed to, not only in the Philadelphia suburbs, as John mentioned, but also in the traditional areas where Democrats have seen some support from the Rust Belt as well. Moving over to the uh, state of Wisconsin, which is probably 
the state that was mo the biggest surprise on election night. I think Michigan was was up there as well. But once again, you saw we saw underperformance in the Milwaukee area. This is the first time that a Republican running for president has won the state of Wisconsin since 1984. 1984. The other one, the other key uh, demographic that we saw was that the millennial population, those 18 to 24, um, underperformed by was it 17 uh, by 17 points, 17 points compared to President Obama in that state. And so, again, not to sound like a broken record, it was a strong support out state, but in, in Dane County, which is the University of Wisconsin, you saw the millennials didn't turn out to vote. You know, pollsters grapple with all the time, you know, they call voters, and let's say they call a 1,000 voters in a particular area. And if they say, well, we don't have enough millennials, we don't have enough African Americans, we don't have enough Hispanics, they will weight the poll to meet what they believe is the election turnout model. And I think the biggest mistake that took place in this election was the pollsters across the board underestimated or underrepresented what the turnout model would be. Everybody expected, because of uh, Trump's comments on the Hispanic population and building the wall, that there would be a huge surge of Hispanic voters. We saw they expected because of President Obama's active participation in the election and what the African American turned out in the last, in his last two re-elections, that there would be continued strong turnout. We, when you look at a state like Wisconsin, those models didn't turn out. Those college-age students, those millennials in Dane County, in where the University of Wisconsin is, they didn't turn out at the levels that many of the pollsters had predicted. Same with Milwaukee County, that the, the numbers were down. And so, while there's a lot of analysis in the at the national level about with pollsters about what went wrong, it was a bad calculation of what the turnout model would be going forward. Yeah, and as those kids that are out there protesting and burning their books and doing whatever it is they're doing in Portland and the rest of the country, and also my wife and I were looking at it last night on TV, and my first reaction was, did they, any of those people vote? And if they didn't, they don't have a right to be in the streets. And that's what a lot of this is going to come down to when the Democrats do their own version of their autopsy that Republicans did themselves after 2012 was, okay, one, why were the polls wrong? As John just mentioned, the people just didn't turn out that they historically had expected them to. And they under, underperformed just along the way. And Wisconsin was probably the surprise state. Michigan, we could have probably seen a little bit better, but Wisconsin was clearly the surprise one. But that is another one with you just underperformed in every single category. It pretty much is the microcosm for the election, whereas in every other state, she underperformed in probably one, but no more than two categories. In this state, she underperformed in every single possible category she possibly could have, whether it was women, as John mentioned, millennials, white men, unions, across the board. And so there's a number of key takeaways you can take from this. But there's but no before, question. Before, Omar, Omar, before you jump off Wisconsin, a very important point. Hillary never visited Wisconsin. After she won the primary against Bernie Sanders, that was a state that she had she thought she had in the bag. And I'm not convinced whether she went once, it would have turned the tide in the state of Wisconsin. But I think you're we are seeing a pattern of that when you campaign in a particular area that it does have an impact on local news media and stuff. And I think that does have an impact and with her not being there and Trump being there a lot, it did allow Trump's message to resonate like it hadn't in other states. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, she basically was a campaign of neglect that led to Michigan and Wisconsin for the most part turning out to the way that they did. And she just took so much for granted, and they ended up focusing too much on universities and cities and forgetting that most of America does not live in either of those two categories. And those are some of the key takeaways were, as we mentioned earlier, the forgotten middle that is the vast majority of the nation that's out there. Voters are completely fed up with business as usual, and the Clintons represented everything that voters right now hate about it. You saw that resonate when they voted for change in 2008. You saw that with the Tea Party movement voting for change in 2010. And you're clearly seeing this being another massive change election, uh, which Hillary was not going to be able to survive if it was truly about change. Because you saw actually in the exit polls that of those members, of those voters that thought it was about change, Trump took 83% of the votes of those that wanted change from Washington. So 
you didn't have a prayer among those those people right there. And and while emails were an issue, I don't think email themselves were an issue. Emails were a symptom of the conclusion that why they need to change. And so I, I was reading news 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 articles today that saying, oh, it was because of email and it was the Comey investigation that had determined the election. I don't think it what it did all it did is it reaffirmed those views of voters who said, hey, we want something different because as Omar said, she represented the status quo and she represented the establishment in Washington. A couple other key takeaways on here. We've discussed the, the Latino issue and looking at how Trump was able to get 29 versus the 27 percent. But again, this is about numbers. And we were just talking John and I a few minutes ago, and basically she underperformed everywhere from a half a point to about two points in almost every category, typically a half a point to one and a half. Latinos, obviously. But then we come back to this looking at how even Trump outperformed uh, Reagan with the white males as the overall percentage out there. I, I personally believe a lot of this has just been coming from the loss of union households that probably happened a long time ago. But one, the change and the hope argument that 08 created with Obama held them together. The automotive support systems put in place helped Obama and the Democrats in 2012, but there wasn't anything else for them to hang their hats on. So they purely walked in a lot of those major counties that we took a look at. And honestly, we'll see I, how I, I, that... I think, I think I, on the union front, Omar, I really think there is a real divide between the union leadership and the union rank and file. And Trump, with his anti-NAFTA, anti-trade perspective, it really created a schism within the union effort. And it'll be interesting to see how the Congress, the Republican Congress, who has tr traditionally been a pro-trade Congress, addresses that schism that we, we saw in this election. Well, and that's, we'll get to some of those issues in a moment because you're right. I think what we potentially might be seeing is every two to three generations or so, the political parties shift. Uh, you saw the shift going back to Lincoln. You saw another shift about the bull, the bull parties uh, coming out there. And then the last major shift came after the Civil Rights Act where Southern Democrats became Northern Republicans and they switched places. Are we seeing that now where Republicans are being economic populists and that's going to have a major effect on the overall trade agenda, exporting, and a lot of the member companies on the call that either have customers or, or some kind of operations in Mexico or overseas or elsewhere. But as we just do a quick look over here at, at the races and how they turned out, the key one for us is the U.S. Senate. Obviously, you need 60 votes to get anything done. But Democrats, in the end, needed to net four with Hillary winning in order to take over the Senate. They needed to net five were at Trump. And in the end, they netted two. So a quick moment of bragging since John and I obviously got the presidency wrong. We at least got the Senate right. We picked 52 would be the final number for Republicans. So that's the one little glory point we can do. Right now, Republicans have 51 seats. There's one election yet to be, yet to be determined. There's a runoff in Louisiana. They have a jungle primary on election day, and if no candidate gets 50%, that at, uh, there's a runoff and they have like 27 candidates, just they have like a million candidates running for the United States Senate in Louisiana. There's a Republican Democrat, the Republican Kennedy, I think he was the Secretary, Secretary of State. He is perceived to be the front runner, the overwhelming front runner to win the special election that will take place in December. And so while the final Senate numbers are not set yet, we believe that in the end will be 52 Republicans, 48 Democrats, or 40 Democrats plus the, or 46 Democrats plus two independents who have, who are caucusing with, with Republicans. And even just taking a quick look at where it was, obviously none really on this slide were all that competitive. Uh, you know, with the Democrats, or excuse me, rather Republicans had only a few bright spots where initially they had hoped to do pickups, because remember, Democrats needed a net four or net five, so Republicans were playing major defense. Two offensive points were going to be Colorado and Nevada. Uh, Colorado was never really on the table for offense. And so those of you from California will take a look at the winner. Obviously, Kamala Harris wasn't so much of a surprise, but Linda Sanchez definitely did take a good amount of the Republican vote that were forced to vote for one or the other in that primary. But also the Marco Rubio is, a, is an interesting one, John, you think? Yeah, and that is really key. One, remember, Marco Rubio basically got bounced out of the presidential race because he lost Florida to Donald Trump. Then he came back to win the Florida Senate race, but not only win the Florida Senate race, but he overperformed Trump. And how he overperformed Trump is, while everybody is giving accolades to Trump on getting 29% of the Hispanic vote, 
Rubio was successful in overperforming even Trump with the Hispanic vote. And so I think many uh, political scientists are going to look at this past election and to see what Trump has done in the Hispanic community. And perhaps many people believe that that 27, 29 percent is a, you know, is the base that Republicans moving forward should expect that kind of percentage. But the way that Rubio was able to overachieve that base of Hispanic vote, whether it's because he, you know, speaks fluent Spanish or what, political scientists will determine that years from now. But that was, I think, the key rate, the key statistic as we look at the Florida Senate race. Right, and also having a last name Rubio certainly helps in those areas where they're trying to balance out their voters. And those of you who know me know I'm not a, not a big fan of his. Now the big question for Rubio is what happens. The only real reason he ran for U.S. Senate is so he could turn around and run for president in four years. Now that he can't do that, he's got to figure out what he actually wants to do here in town, if he wants to be a U.S. Senator, if he's going to uh, see what he ends up doing. Those are some of the questions you've got as you look forward to some of the others here. Mark Kirk in Illinois was not a real surprise on there. I didn't think it was going to be a 14% blowout. I kind of personally thought it was going to be 8 to 10, but that is quite significant. But Mark Kirk had a number of issues along the ways there. With the Indiana race, that's one that we'd obviously been watching for some time. On the Evan Bay came out, he switched out and replaced uh, another former congressman named Baron Hill at the request of both the Clinton campaign, but really at Chuck Schumer. Schumer basically walked up to former Senator Evan Bayh. He used to be governor. His dad was governor. The name is Gold in Indiana, basically the Bayh name, or had been for a while. And Schumer said, look, you only got to run for four months. You're sitting on $9.3 million in the bank. You can do this. You can win this. But in the end, the main problem was he didn't remember where he lived. He didn't know his own home address in Indiana. He hadn't visited it since 2010. And that is a major problem if you want to win election from a state. You probably need to know where your house is. A, a surprise race was in the state of Missouri where Roy Blunt won his reelection. Now, leading up to the election, Omar and I were pessimistic about, about Roy Blunt's prospects of winning. He won, he was running against a Marine, a, a former veteran who could assemble an, an a, a, a assault rifle with his eyes, with, with himself blindfolded. And his wife is, I mean, he's been in Congress for, for many, many years. His wife is a lobbyist. The kids are a lobbyist. Roy Blunt was the ultimate establishment candidate, yet he was able to succeed largely because of the strong turnout that we saw for the Trump voters. And the Trump, those are one of the, few, this is one of the few states where Trump brought along a Republican. And we'll talk about some other states like Pennsylvania where uh, President, uh, where Pat Toomey ended up winning in that race. But that was because of the lower turnout. That's why he won. But Blunt won because of the strong Republican turnout for Blunt in the state of Missouri. So the anti-Washington message that we've seen that's been resonating throughout the country really seemed mostly limited and focused on the presidential level, where Hillary took the blame as the business as usual, whereas down ballot, a lot of folks seem to be a little bit more insulated. We even saw in California with some folks on the House side had some scares. They ended up surviving in many of those places where Frankly, they probably should not have if there was going to be a true, full-on, full-throated anti-Washington message out there. Like Richard Burr was not a good campaigner for the Republicans there, but the Democrat that they offered up and instead there was more of Erskine Bowles was from North Carolina. I know what that means. He was too much of a elitist, northeast liberal Democrat, and that still doesn't work in a state that still feels a little bit more like the South down there in North Carolina. But honestly, we believe that the best run, single best run Senate campaign in the entire country was Rob Portman in Ohio, but also the single worst Senate run campaign in the entire country was by former Governor Ted Strickland, also in Ohio. Rob Portman was able to raise a tremendous amount of money. He was able to reach out to the union households. Actually, he actually is one of the few Republicans who received support from union organizations, not just union households. And he overperformed not only just what a typical Republican would do would he even overperform what Donald Trump did in the state of Ohio. His campaign will be a textbook campaign moving forward for any candidate running statewide, statewide in the state of Ohio. Yeah, particularly in midterm. I think you're right, John. I think more, I take that extra step, too. I think it's going to be textbook for how to run in a Donald Trump presidency if you're up for a midterm in 2018. When you look at Pat Toomey on there, we did have Pat Toomey winning later on, but that really is the same reason for what Portman did. Portman was able to pull one in five Democrats. So basically, if your opponent is pulling 20, and he's a Republican, pulling 20% of Democrats, you don't have a prayer. There's no way that's going to happen. Katie McGinty over in Pennsylvania, we saw the polling that was 
back, I think it was early October, late September, she was only pulling at 76 or so, 75, 74% on Democrats. In the end, she only got 86% of Democrats to vote for her. And the rest of them, for the most part, voted for Pat Toomey. And in a state where, as John mentioned during the presidential slide, you're really focused on the collar counties around Philly and a little bit of Pittsburgh and Allegheny and Erie, you got real problems, especially when Erie ended up flipping over to Trump. So McGinty was not a good candidate. She, a Democrat could have won, somebody that had better name recognition and could have at least covered her base. You cannot get less than 90% of your own party's vote and still expect to win a state as, as large as that one. But Wisconsin was the big shocker, right, John? Yeah, the, Wisconsin was probably the shock of the night. And for those of you who have heard Omar and I give presentations, we talk about we rank the seats based on the likelihood of it flipping. And we had Mark Kirk in Illinois as number one and Ron Johnson in, in Wisconsin as number two. Perception in Washington was Ron Johnson was a dead man walking. He was running against the, the man he defeated, Russ Feingold, uh, six years ago. Feingold had the money, had the establishment. He was a presidential year where Wisconsin voters overwhelmingly voted, voted Democrat. As I said in the presidential slide, Republicans had, hadn't won the presidency since 1984 in Wisconsin. But like Pat Toomey, Ron Johnson won, was able to appeal to the Republican base, and he had strong support with the Republican base. And then two, the lower turnout in Dane County, University of Wisconsin, and Milwaukee area really doomed Feingold, the Democrat um, prospects for winning state, statewide in that state. And you know, as a as a note, Ron Johnson Ron Johnson is the only manufacturer in the United States Senate. He's a plastics manufacturer. We are thrilled to have him back in the United States Senate, along with Ron Johnson. Through NTMA's PAC, we were very successful in making in giving contributions because of your generous support to folks like Pat Toomey, folks like Roy Blunt, folks like Richard Byrd, to to um, uh, Marco Rubio. And so your support from the Political Action Committee was very instrumental as we helped many of these candidates win and know that they will be serving in the United States Senate in the next Congress. Yeah, we're really grateful. And on a personal note, Russ Feingold was one of my three least favorite senators I ever lobbied in the last 20 years. So we are very, very glad that he's not coming back to Washington, D.C. But if you look at where we go next from here for the Democrats, there's not a whole lot of good-looking options for them, especially this just got worse. This was their chance to take it back because just as Demo Republicans rather had about 23, 24 members of their own to defend this cycle, Democrats have 25 members they have to defend in the U.S. Senate next year, including independents, whereas Republicans only have about nine or ten of them. And that's a real, real problem. If you take a look on that right-hand side of the screen, you're looking at Indiana, Joe Donnelly, Sherrod Brown, Ohio, Tammy Baldwin, Wisconsin. These are some real swing states, and we have core manufacturing interests before you even factor in Republican states, traditionally, such as the North Dakotas and the West Virginias of the world. You've got another Casey coming up for re-election. So there's a lot of Repu Democrats, rather, that are very concerned. So, no, we at this point, barring a major wave, major scandal, major issue, find it very difficult to see how a Democrat could come in and take back over the U.S. Senate in 2018. We don't think that, at least personally, John, I don't think they have a real chance to take it back until 2020 at this point in the U.S. Senate. And prior to the election, Omar and I were predicting that uh, Democrats would pick up between 12 and 20 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. It's turned out there's only been a handful of seats that have switched. Uh, switched. I, last I heard, there were still four seats that were open that hadn't been decided, many of them in California. But right now, the Republicans used, used to have 247. Now it's down to 238, 239 possibly with, with four open seats. And so... House Republicans didn't lose as many as they had hoped. You know, a month before the election, Nancy Pelosi was was looking at a wave and, and saying that well, perhaps Republicans would not only lose the Senate but lose the House of Representatives. The strong showing by by Trump and the underperformance of the Democrat base that we've talked about meant that many vulnerable Republicans who were in challenging races ended up winning their reelection. And again, those of us that heard you and you, John, or myself speak in the past, we've been pretty blunt about Pelosi and Democrats not having a chance to take it back, to take the House back to at least 2020 post redistricting. And we think this pretty much reaffirms and solidifies that, particularly as we move forward again, barring a major wave or a major sweep or a major scandal like we might, like we saw back in the 06 range of things that are just out of control of just general policy and we call them act of God and insurance world kind of thing. 
and, 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 and when you look at the, when you when you look at some of the races that Republicans lost, it wasn't did not come as a big surprise to Omar and I. These are the people who were probably the most vulnerable in Florida, North Florida, North Orlando. John Micah, the 12th term member of Congress, he his district represented the uh, Trayvon Martin area and where the nightclub shooting took place. His district had changed dramatically during redistricting. He was a 12-year member of Congress who hadn't had a competitive race in a number of years. And when I spoke down in Florida, I said, watch out, keep an eye out on, on, on Micah's congressional seat because he hadn't run a competitive race in a while. He had a very strong, energetic Democrat opponent. He ended up winning. In Illinois, you had Bob Dole, who was running. It was a rematch. He defeated a member of Congress, Brad Sherman, and, uh, and uh, it was a rematch. And in a presidential year in Illinois, the Democrats ended up winning that race. And so you had a case in New Jersey where Scott Garrett made a, you know, said some comments that were relatively controversial regarding the gay and lesbian community. And in New Jersey, that had an impact. And so those races that Republicans ended up losing or the Democrats ended up winning were not surprising races. No, they really weren't. So as we talked about that Trump effect, where was it felt? It was pretty much just limited to the suburbs, which many of us had already thought. And with Fitzpatrick, we figured that would he'd hang on there, and not to make fun of those Philly fans out there, but probably, most of them probably thought they were voting for the brother, didn't know who he was. But some of that however, how, however, if turnout turned out, if, if the Democrats turned out in the collar around Philadelphia, Brent Fitzpatrick, it would have been a much closer race than it ended up turning out. But because of the lack of turnout that we talked about, Fitzpatrick won with a pretty large margin, which many thought would be a very tight race. Kind of. Nine uh, percent is, is more than just the turnout spread. But as John mentioned, you look at northern Chicago where the Dold race was. That one goes back and forth. That's been a three-time matchup. That was one of the most expensive races in the entire country. It was $17 million poured into that one. In Palm Beach, you're looking at about $23 million of outside money poured into that. For us, the real question is, okay, now we know what's happened. Obama and Trump met yesterday at the White House. You notice, though, that Michelle and Melania did not meet together with Trump and Obama. I'm speculation, at least personal, is that Michelle probably didn't want to be take, have a photo taken with Trump in the same room. But they did meet separately. They did start the process. So where do we go from here? And so let's start with logistics before we get to speculation on what can and cannot happen. Obviously, they met yesterday. So, John, next week, the House is coming in on the 14th. The Senate's coming in on the 15th. But all of us in D.C. are watching the House Republican leadership votes next Tuesday. There is with Trump's election, there is speculation, which I'm not, I'm not necessarily buying right now, that the Freedom Caucus, the very conservative, uh, conservative members of the House of Representatives, are dissatisfied with Paul Ryan because of his disavowing of Donald Trump in this election. There is speculation that somebody would end up challenging Ryan for the speakership. You can't challenge a speaker without a name. And with the leadership elections taking place next week, no name has emerged. So and after yesterday's uh, uh, meeting with Trump and with Paul Ryan, perhaps the, you know, there was a kiss, a kiss and makeup session that we don't necessarily believe there's going to be a challenge to Paul Ryan within the Republican conference. But no, you know, uh, stranger things have happened. The biggest issue that has to be dealt with is Congress never passed any of their appropriations bills prior to the fiscal year starting on October 1. And so then the debate is, do they do a continuing resolution submitting at last year's levels for all of next year through September 30th? Do they pass a bill, an omnibus bill, which combines the work that they have done based on a new funding levels for this year? Or some sort of combination of of, the, of both of them, and so that is going to be the battle in the Congress over the next over the next uh, 60 days before the, the Congress ends on January 2nd. We expect Congress to pass a funding bill. We do not anticipate a government shutdown. There are those who believe there are some in the conservative caucus who says we should punt this funding funding resolutions till March and let the new president take over. There are others probably more of the establishment, who say, let's let President Trump start new, and let's get last year's business behind us and start anew. And so that will be the debate, the discussion that is taking place over the next um, you know, six weeks in Congress. Anybody's guess of how this ends up turning out.
the house. So when we back. wrote our books on it, and that was the next steps. So as you look at January 3rd, it was the Tuesday when the next Congress comes in. Obviously, the president will be sworn in on Friday, a couple of weeks later. But right now, we want to really just give a quick overview of what is realistic, what can be done, and what cannot be done. A president's going back decades and generations, always promise all kinds of things in a campaign that they know full well that they cannot deliver during the general, and this is pretty historic and pretty regular and pretty anticipated. The question is, what can you do? So as you look at a pie going 100% all the way towards what you claimed on the campaign trail, you have to at least do something in each of those categories. So can he legally immediately withdraw on day one from NAFTA? The answer is no. There's obviously a number of legal proceedings that you have to go through, a number of notifications. And keep in mind that NAFTA is more than a singular document. It became a series of side agreements over the years that build out on the original. And the, some of the question remains on whether some of those side agreements that are actually have more teeth and implementation factor and value, how are those subject to some of this? So there's going to be a number of questions, just as how does he address the legal currency manipulation the next opportunity to name them, China, for example, as a currency manipulation won't be until April or May report. That's, again, not a day one issue, but there are some things that he can do to an extent on day one. And then then the question is, you know, is he going to, is he going to build a wall? I think Omar and I are slightly, are not completely in agreement on this one. I believe it may, if it's not a physical wall, it will be a symbolic wall. We've already seen Senator McConnell Senate Majority Leader talking not so much about a wall, but but about enhancing border security. I think that will be paramount. But before any of that happens, there'll have to be an appropriations by Congress to increase funding to enhance border security. Whether it's a wall, whether it's enhanced border security with personnel, or some sort of fence and some sort of cyber technology utilized. So it will take an act of Congress to make sure that happens. And so that's not going to be something that's going to happen on day one of the Trump administration. But I definitely see him doing a photo op in front of a segment of a wall. It's just not going to be 3,000 miles long. So they'll, they'll get to that. As John mentioned, the low-hanging fruit, the easy part is to see what you can do. What holes can you plug? Are you going to be able to deport 11 million people on day one? No, of course not. Um, but you are going to be able to increase a focus, just as even, frankly, Obama did a couple of years ago, 18 months ago, on increasing deportations. From our standpoint, from the manufacturing, where we are focusing on are the environmental areas, in particular, is, is a great focus for us. And that, frankly, is what comes back to the Supreme Court. Right now, if you recall back to the uh, slide that we showed on the Senate, that they're really only that, for in terms of the Supreme Court nominee, Trump probably only has to convince six to eight Democrats, depending on the nominee that he puts forward. So if he only has to swing seven or eight, that's probably doable as you look at the North Dakotas and the West Virginia senators that are up for re-election next time and the time after. So those are very, very doable. And the reason that we just departed to talk about Supreme Court quickly is because a number of these areas on policy points, any president coming in only has really limited ability and authority to just overturn them on day one. So for example, a lot of the environmental regulations are actually a process of statutory requirements or legal requirements. So for example, W got sued all the time by the enviros. He didn't want to put out any of those regulations, obviously, but the lawsuits forced the federal agencies to move forward. And so as a general rule, nothing official or scientific, we say that probably on day one there's only about 25% of actual policy, but on day one that they can immediately stop. But on health care, for example, Obamacare, yes, he can be initiate on day one legislation to begin the repeal process. But again, there are a number of things that he can start, but not all that many that immediately can happen on day one with the sign of a pen. Trump's most effective tool is on day one will be repealing many of the executive orders that the president had signed over the course of the four years and more importantly over the course of the last year. We do anticipate in repealing many of those executive orders, perhaps not all of them, because it does leave hole on, on some of the areas, for example, on Obamacare and how they're going to deal with some of the issues. Some of those issues have been challenged in court right now, whether the president had that authority and whether President Trump will determine, let's let the judicial system work its work its way or just withdraw that executive order is yet to be determined. And so I think that's a really important point because executive orders, there are some things that are very, very doable on day one. I mean, not to repeal Dodd-Frank right away, but on the fiduciary rule that is really affecting a lot of small business owners in terms of the advice that they receive from their financial advisors. John and I just had our meeting annual requirement under Todd Frank meeting with our guy on Monday. 
it's the same thing. Those are some areas that can be rolled back. OSHA is an area, NLRB is an area, some Department of Treasury regulations is an area, but unfortunately the big one for us that is EPA is going to be very difficult. So as John mentioned though, where are some of the priorities? We're not allowed to use the word stimulus in this town anymore, but I think we're all in agreement in DC that we are looking at some form of an infrastructure job stimulus measure bill that will come out of this Congress fairly quickly. You know, and Trump has made it pretty clear that is going to be among his top priorities. I, I believe there are three things that Trump needs to do in his during his honeymoon period. How long how long that lasts, whether it's a year, year and a half, or two years, as Omar said, has to do a stimulus package to rebuild our roads, bridges, and schools. Two, he has to address the border issue, whether it's a wall, some sort of enhanced border security. And three, he has to address the Affordable Care Act. There is differing views in this town whether the Affordable Care Act can be repealed. I think there'll probably be a vote to repeal it in the House for the 46th time. You don't have the 60 votes in the Senate to repeal it again. And so what changes take place, what dramatic changes this new Congress will do to change the Affordable Care Act moving forward. So I think those are the three things that this Trump administration is going to focus on immediately. Uh, well, probably not the Affordable Care Act. That may take some time to put together because you're going to need an alternative. And right now, Trump has been very vague on what his alternative is and lack of specifics. And so that may take some time. But the infrastructure program and some sort of enhanced border security, which would go through the appropriations process, are the two issues that I think can have some immediate impact. And we're going to take questions in just a minute, so those of you that, that can, please start thinking and formulating and typing in the right-hand side. But as we look at some of these priorities here where we are, I, definitely I personally believe on oil exploration, I think he's going to be able to roll back some of the initial requirements and, or excuse me, restrictions that Obama had put in over the last two to three years in particular. That'll be an area of focus. On corporate tax reform, we are, are, are fairly hopeful on this one. As we had told many of you when we spoke, we thought there was a 33% chance under Hillary we could get some kind of a business corporate tax reform under Trump. We think it's a two-third chance, not on individual, but definitely on international and most likely on corporate as well. And we've already started to have some discussions with congressional staff over the last month, well ahead of the election. So NTMA is well-primed and well-positioned on that in terms of where we can go and, and where, we do, where we do things. But quickly coming back to trade, because we're going to have a number of questions we assume from our members on this, and we encourage most of you to just reach out to us offline and we can answer some of your specifics. Because Don and I are already receiving inquiries from a number of our One Voice members saying, I've got a, a rep down in Mexico or a customer in Mexico that's freaking out right now. Or what do I tell my Chinese sales reps out there in terms of how this is going to affect the business sales coming out of our American facilities? So there are going to be a number of of knowns out there in terms of what we can figure out and what can be done and how we can change things. But initially, keep in mind that many of the trade requirements come through trade laws that are in there. So for example, if Trump did want to go in and fight on currency manipulation, he would first have to label China and Japan currency manipulators in the first couple of months, and that probably would be about four to five months in. Then that it triggers an official negotiating period if the two parties can't negotiate a solution then it goes to the World Trade Organization, and now you're looking at about 18 months. And so, again, we're not trying to damper. We're not trying to say that Trump can or cannot do something on day one. These are just realities of the laws that are of our land. And so, for example, if he were to start a trade war with China, the Chinese would probably stand to lose more than us, but there will be enough pressure points. So if he start, if the Chinese retaliate against textiles, then Trump's buddy Jeff Sessions in Alabama is going to be real concerned. When they start attacking chickens, uh, which is normally the first target point, and beef and lumber, that's going to cause some real pain and real challenges for a number of folks throughout there. So on the trade areas where many of us are looking for some kind of relief, we are a little bit hesitant and kind of give an overall prediction. The new transition person for U.S. trade representative is Dan D'Amico, the former uh, head of Nucor, who has been an amazing champion of manufacturing in America over the years, but also, as many of you know, has been quite, quite uh, anti-trade on a number of a number of fronts. So there is some concern, especially given the NTMA surveys that we get back from you all, tell us just over 50% of you all directly export to another country. So we are certainly, of all the unknowns that we are following, trade is probably the greatest unknown, we think, from a policy standpoint in terms of Trump's next steps, particularly given he still has a lot of the old guard Chamber of Commerce thinking Republicans like Paul Ryan still in the town.
So with that, we're going to give you a little bit of hope, maybe not. Uh, as you look at the 700 and now about 727 days until the next election, that's when the Democrats are going to have their chance to take back the House, take back the Senate, neither of which we really think is going to happen. But this chart right here, just focus on the colors, blue to red, back and forth. As you notice, the cycle just endures. We told people repeatedly, whether it was President Hillary or President Trump, the union will endure, the republic will move forward. Things in the United States domestically will continue to chug along. The economy will be cyclical, just as you saw the Dow Jones. If you're looking at the markets right now. What we're going to continue to probably expect to see is in terms of infrastructure, anything that is domestic made, uh, Caterpillar, maybe not that much since they're down globally so much. But you could see U.S. Steel and those folks are already starting to go up because they're expecting some kind of a domestic infrastructure bill with sourcing here. Some of the healthcare folks. Those numbers and stocks are probably going to slip a little bit, especially as we get closer to getting a better understanding of what they're going to do on Obamacare and all that. But as you can see, the House and the Senate traditionally watching the blue of the red lines right here with the exception of the 40-year drought that Republicans had in the House until the 94 revolution, things tend to go back and forth, uh, whether it's the politics or the economy or the markets, things tend to be cyclical and balance things out eventually. And even more excited, we know you can't wait till the next one. The big question is what do Democrats do from here, and we're not going to get into that on this call right now or on this webinar, but Democrats are in a real loss. They need to do their own version of an autopsy. They need to figure out what happened. Why couldn't we get our people out there? Why couldn't young people come out? Why didn't women really resonate with Hillary as much? Moving forward, can we still survive on a urban-only strategy, looking at cities and schools? We've got to branch out beyond that and try to recapture some of the those manufacturing voters out there and many of those rest belt quadrants and, and corners out there. So and many of those conversations are clearly obviously beginning right now within the Democratic Party. Uh, with that, we'll happy to sit online for another couple minutes if anybody wants to type in a couple of questions. As always, you all know how to reach John and myself or, or Christian, some of the folks back at NTMA headquarters. Please feel free to email us specifically if it's a good question that's targeted towards your business or to one of your customers that you may have out there. You know, Omar brought up a, a very good point. And when you look at that map by county of the nation and by any given state, if you recall, the state of Pennsylvania or the state of Michigan or the state of Wisconsin, is much of the states were red, which are Republican areas, and the blue areas were just those urban areas. And I really think the Democratic Party really needs to do a serious self-examination of how they can do a better job of attracting the vote in rural America if they're going to be successful because overwhelmingly when you look across the country it's just those pockets of, of urban suburban areas and even in suburban areas where Democrats thought they would have high optimism moving into this election the suburban model didn't work out as well they won some suburban areas but not at the levels that they had in the past and I think that's going to be a real discussion point within the Democratic Party of where they go. Another one is, what is you know, I, the discussion's already taking place. Should the Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders wing of the party, would he have done better against a Donald Trump versus a, a Hillary Clinton who was perceived as more of a moderate Democrat versus a more progressive, more liberal Democrat like Bernie Sanders? Those, again, those decisions, those discussions are taking place right now. And then on the Republican side, there is, you know, some self-examination of their own of how the hell did Donald Trump do this? And because it was a true surprise to many in Washington and around the country that at 2.45, 2.48 in the morning, the day after the election, Donald Trump you know, received a call from Hillary Clinton congratulating him for being elected president of the United States. How did that happen? And I think there's going to have to be some true self-examination of the Republicans, how that happened, and and how nobody had anticipated that happening. So, but part of that really does segue into policy because I think a lot of Republicans are now going to have to look. Well, does our approach to tax reform is it exactly the same as it was before? As we talked about a little bit ago, that Republicans are now shifting to a populist economic platform, and so if you're going to economic populism. Does the tax cuts for the wealthy really resonate anymore? And we probably think that no, the answer is it does not. So as we look at the context of business and tax reform, knowing that the vast, vast majority of NTA members are pass-throughs, that has been our pretty much major cry here in D.C. since 2012, was you've got to take care of the pass-throughs. You can't just focus on corporate only. 
we are pretty confident at this point, based on our conversations with the Ways and Means staff that are more advanced than the Senate staffers are on this front, that they are looking at dealing with pass-through entities and working on how to treat business income. Now, they are going to differentiate between passive and active income because they cannot be perceived, especially in a populist economic environment as this, that they are giving tax cuts to the wealthy on Wall Street. If they are giving pa pass-throughs or those hedge fund managers of five employees and don't make it or do anything, massive tax cuts from 39.6, 44.6 down to 30 or 28, that's not going to happen, not going to fly, especially among the economic populace increasingly in their parties. So we are hopeful that they are going to do pass-throughs, including in that business tax reform. Pass-throughs, it would be tough to see you getting a whole lot below 28 to 30 percent. The numbers and the math just doesn't work based on current spending and projections in the out years. But the, those are certainly in, in the conversation. As I mentioned, John and I are actively have been having conversations with the Ways and Means staff for some time, and they are probably pretty close. We expect in the sometime in January to get a pretty solid pen to paper document out of House Republicans on tax reform that we hope to be very pleased with, particularly since they're focusing on business tax investment, like 100% business expensing and things that we've been championing for years. Another area that Republicans have always been the party of the budget deficit or concerned about the budget deficit under this populist president and throughout this presidential campaign, there has not been a lot of discussion about the budget deficit. And when we were looking at a Trump infrastructure program, a tax provision, a tax uh, a plan offered by both presidential candidates quite candidly, but Trump that was is somewhat vague and doesn't is not revenue neutral. It would only increase enhance the budget deficit of how the budget deficit discussion plays moving forward. Right now, based on what the voter said, is economic stimulus is more important than a long term fiscal sanity. And so that is going to be another internal discussion that Republicans and the Democrats are going to have to deal with moving forward. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as we look at what will happen next, uh, we had a question on will entitlement reform actually happen? Uh, let me be overly blunt. One, no, uh, it won't happen because there still isn't a groundswell for it. Congress tends to, Washington tends to act when we're at a total disaster point. And while many of us see that happening, the disaster point isn't until mid-2030s or so. Uh, more importantly than that, I believe, is again, comes back to that economic populism argument that Trump put out there. Most important thing that I believe he said in the context of healthcare is we were not going to let anybody die in the streets. And I'm not trying to disprove the negative by saying traditional Republicans want people dying in the streets, but it's so much that he is looking for some form of a safety net. And if you are going to reform Social Security, by definition, that means taking away benefits from somebody at some point in this cycle. And I just see it very difficult for Trump to really wrap his arms about that being part of the fiscal response. He didn't run on fiscal responsibility or issues. He ran on change, but it was more of having everybody get a voice. Everybody getting a voice entitlement reform typically means taking something away, and we just don't think that at this point that is where he's looking, which is why the John statements just a moment ago on the fiscal responsibility with regards to the spending I don't think it's going to be Democrats that stop him along the way. Once they get the courage and the comfort after about four to six months, you're increasingly going to see a number of Republicans standing up and saying, wait, hold on, somebody's got to pay for all this, and we don't have the money now, whether it's the wall or whether it's something else. The infrastructure projects are going to be through the roof unless you find a way to pay for them, which means increased taxes. To, to Omar's point, I mean, the president-elect uh, president Trump has already said he's not going to touch Social Security. Well, if you're going to address the long-term impact of Social Security, you know, it, it gets in fiscal insolvency, and I think it's 2030, maybe it's Medicare in 2030. They're going to have to address the entitlement issue. This is an issue that I would think after year two of a Trump administration, maybe year five of a Trump administration, that the political reality, the economic reality will set in. But in this honeymoon era where Trump is going to try to fix all that is ill and try to come across as very bipartisan, I don't think that's going to happen in, in, in the near term. 
And just before we wrap up, again, any last minute questions, please type them in. Uh, just an economic question in, in terms of, again, coming back to where we were, cyclical, we saw the Dow futures drop about 500 points around 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and they immediately rebounded after we saw what Obama did in terms of his concession, after Hillary did hers a little after 12.30 in the afternoon rush, and we're well back over 18,000 on the Dow. Um, so typically what happens around now economically is, yes, you do see investment low and kind of slow as people are taking a little bit more of a guarded approach. If nothing else, Trump was already right off the bat able to weaken the dollar, so that's a good thing. We've been trying for years to get a weaker dollar so we can start exporting again and people buying our goods. But I think the general melees, as the questioner put it for the third quarter, some of that is instinctive among the markets in terms of an election, and you'll continue to see that into the fourth quarter. But if we do have that peaceful transition, particularly if enough Democrats and rather Republicans go along with the stimulus, will come up for a new word for it, promise, but basically an infrastructure spending program, that will help the markets. Overall demand, though, however, we still just don't see a whole lot of major growth coming in this country, anywhere below or above two points minus, two points up, two and a half here and there, rarely crossing three on any quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. And that's just going to be the new normal from what many believe. Economists we talk to think that the next recession will be that final quarter of 2018, starting in 2019 when we're looking at the next uh, presidential re-election cycle. Uh, the lastly, on the economic front and the melees, it's really the rest of the world that's driving us. The United States is the only bright spot out there. Everything in South America is slow. Europe is slow, with the exception of the United Kingdom, which is now insourcing. So we are probably expecting a no major spikes on the domestic front. If we do get an infrastructure bill, that's probably where we do see an economic spike coming. If there aren't any other questions, you will have our email addresses up here, and you know how to reach the NTMA folks, as always. Thank you for bearing with us through what was a very challenging, at times, a difficult, frustrating presidential cycle. But again, things have settled. We'll, we'll have a better understanding of where things sit towards the end of next week when the House leadership elections are done, and obviously as President Trump continues to formulate his transition team, as we could go into speculation on cabinet secretaries, but frankly, that would just be speculation as a lot of the media people are honestly planning their own names in the media so they can drum up their own support. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please recall that if you need a copy of this PowerPoint, reach out. It's been recorded, and we will send it out to you as well. Thank you, as always, for being part of NTMA and supporting John and ourselves and the folks back in, the, in Ohio throughout this whole process. Thank you very much. Thank you.